Daniel 6. But let's start with the last verse of Daniel 5. Daniel 5, verse 31. And the rise the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Chapter 6. It pleased the rise to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty satraps, who should be in all the kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should render account, and that the king should suffer no loss. Now this Daniel surpassed the presidents and the satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to appoint him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the satraps thought to find a pretext against Daniel with respect to the kingdom, but they could not find any pretext or fault, inasmuch as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any pretext against this Daniel, unless we find it against him touching the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came in a body to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days except of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. And when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his upper chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did for time. But those men came in a body and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spoke before the king concerning the king's decree, Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask anything of any God or man within thirty days except of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians which may not be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore distressed thereby, and set his heart on Daniel to save him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him, then these men came in a body unto the king, and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establishes may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions. The king spoke and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will save thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his nobles, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace, and passed the night fasting, neither were concubines brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose with light at break of day, and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came near unto the den, he cried with a mournful voice unto Daniel, the king spoke and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has thy God, whom thou servest continually, been able to save thee from the lions? Then Daniel spoke unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel, and has shut the lions' mouth, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocence was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt, Thereupon was the king exceeding glad, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions 
had the mastery of them and broke all their bones in pieces. Here they came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote unto all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He saves and delivers, and he works signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, who has saved Daniel from the power of the light. And this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So far the reading of the scriptures. Tonight we come to the climax of the first part of the book of Daniel. We have seen so far that the book is a prophecy. Even this historic part, chapters 1 to 6, is prophecy in itself. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 24 speaks of Daniel the prophet, not Daniel the historian. And although these chapters are historical, accurate, and true, they give prophecy in themselves. They are like prophetic illustrations. We have compared this in the past also with the book of Jonah. There are other portions in the scriptures which are stories or uh, in other way types of prophetic events like we have in the book of Esther and in many other portions of the scriptures. Now we come to the climax of this first part of the book of Daniel. We have seen how Israel had become unfaithful to God, how the God of the whole earth related to Israel has become the God of the heavens, has withdrawn himself from his earthly people. Ezekiel 9 to 11, we see how the glory of God departed from them, from the temple and from the people from Jerusalem and how God consequently gave this authority which he had given to the king of Israel into the hands of the head of the Gentiles. And so we see here in Daniel 1 the beginning of the times of the Gentiles, Luke 21, the Lord refers to this period which will end only when the Lord Jesus himself, as we have seen in Daniel 2, will start to reign publicly over this world. We have in Daniel 1 to 6 a presentation of the development of, the, of these times of the Gentiles. Daniel 2 we had an outline and in Daniel 3 we had a one of the characteristics of this period of the Gentiles, idolatry. Instead of using this God-given authority for God's glory, it's used for man and essentially for Satan. In chapter 4 we have seen how there was another element added, glory of man, in a special way, uh, self-exaltation, setting aside the rise of God, pride, arrogance, and how God dealt with this. We have seen the worst form of evil in Daniel 5, how Belshazzar, knowing what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, went even further than Nebuchadnezzar ever went and acted in blasphemy, in contempt against God, real iniquity. And we have seen how God's judgment fell right away over upon him. And also we have seen that these chapters, which are historical chapters and have a definite prophetic meaning, have also practical moral lessons for us. And even we could say chapter 5 and the other chapters speak also in this sense of the history of the church. We see in the so-called Christian countries how people mock at God and his rights, as we see especially in Daniel 5. And so God's judgment will come first upon the so-called Christian nations, as we will see, as we may see in the book of Revelation. Now, in chapter 6, we see another form of uh, evil. Here we have man usurping God's place. It is 
the real apostasy. Um, we see this development already in Genesis 3. Man wanted to take God's place. And here we see how in the future a man will take God's place. As we have in many other places. We think of Revelation 13 where we have the image of the beast placed in the temple. As we see in 2 Thessalonians 2. Antichrist presenting himself as being God. This is apostasy and also blasphemy and the other elements we have seen of idolatry and self-exaltation are all combined as it were in the future leaders of the Roman Empire and Israel. In connection with some general re remarks before we start with verse 1 I would like to repeat something about the future remnant. We have seen how Daniel and his friends typify the future remnant in a special way. They were really sane and also they had spiritual intelligence. We have seen uh, different sections in the book of Daniel referring in the future also to this future remnant. So the remnant we see literally in chapters 1 to 6 as we see it in the future from Daniel 7, the uh, saints and in Daniel 11 and 12, the wise men. But we see another feature of this remnant in their sufferings. In Daniel 3, it was Daniel's friends. In Daniel 6, it is Daniel himself. And there we see Daniel not only as a type of the future remnant, but also as a type of the Lord Jesus. When we read and study the Psalms carefully, we see how the Lord Jesus identifies himself with the sufferings of the remnant. He suffered under the hands of man and as such he identifies himself with the sufferings of the future end suffering in the hands of man there are many parallels with the sufferings of the Lord Jesus in Daniel 6 as we hope to see in more detail we have in chapter 5 verse 31 the thought that Darius the Mede received the kingdom we have noticed already in chapter 2 that there would be this transfer of power to a second empire and here this happens so the rise the meat received the kingdom we may see in one sense as from God's hands after he had to judge the Babylonian empire because of their unfaithfulness God transfers this authority to the second empire but he received the kingdom also from Cyrus. Uh, the end of chapter 6 we have read the name of Cyrus and at the end of this meditation we hope to see some passages about him in the book of Isaiah. Now Cyrus became the, was the most important leader and he gave the authority over Babylon to Darius. We have seen in chapter 5 how Babylon was taken by the Medes and the Persians and there are other references in the book of Daniel about this two-sided kingdom. I mean a kingdom uh, united but at the same time two different aspects. In Daniel 7 you hope to see that the Medes in the beginning were more important than the Persians but gradually the Persians uh, received supremacy and here we see how Cyrus himself uh, a Semite um, had a supremacy and gave the domain over Babylon into the hands of Darius we have noticed also how God had predicted this judgment over Babylon in Isaiah and in Jeremiah how God had foreseen that then the Medes and the Persians would take over and so here we have the start of this second empire which existed already earlier of course but now is officially the second empire having received authority from God as we have seen also in Daniel 2 now this King Darius comes to us in a sympathetic way in this chapter not a person like Belshazzar as we have seen in Daniel 5 but nevertheless in this chapter we see also how he is weak, how he stands for man in his weakness and as such falls easily into sin. 
On the other hand, we see also in Darius a picture of the nations, the nations who will accept at the end God's authority, God's greatness, and will be impressed also by God's dealings with the remnant. They will be impressed, as we know from other scriptures, by God's dealings with the future remnant, with Israel, and as such they will honor God and will be introduced in the millennium. Whereas others among the nations, like we see in the enemies of Daniel, his opponents, they will be judged and killed, as we have also read in Daniel 6, verse 24. So Darius would uh, represent also those nations, as we have in Matthew 25, who have a sympathetic attitude towards Israel, whereas the other nations, which are enemies, are judged and will not enter into the millennium. By the way, it's remarkable how all these chapters, uh, from chapter 2 through 6, end with the thought of the millennium. And that's remarkable. And at the same time, uh, we'll give God the glory. Chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 end with the thought of the millennial reign and God's glory. Now, in verse 1, we see how Darius sets up his administration in a similar way as we find also in the book of Esther. Then he has three presidents of whom Daniel was one, and then he wants to place Daniel at the head of them. So Daniel would really become the third one, as in chapter 5 was already suggested by Belshazzar, Cyrus, Darius, and then Daniel would be the third one, or in a sense also the second one, the second under the rise. Now this causes the jealousy of the other presidents and the other satraps and we see how they try to find something against Daniel to accuse him. In verse 3 we see how there was an excellent spirit in Daniel. We have read already in chapter 5 about this excellent spirit. Now the queen mother <coughs> referred to Belshazzar about Daniel in ten different ways in chapter 5 verse 11 and 12 ten different characteristics he gave of this excellent spirit in Daniel and we see here in chapter 6 verse 3 how Darius had the respect really for Daniel chapter 4 excuse me verse 4 concludes that they could not find any pretext or fault. What a wonderful testimony is this. So the future remnant will have a wonderful testimony among the nations. But how about us? We have seen how these chapters have a very practical meaning for us. There are many practical lessons. We may think first of all of the Lord Jesus himself. In his mouth would uh, not be found any guile. No wrong word would come from his mouth. No wrong action. And we see that even Pilate and uh, the, the centurion gave testimony of his perfection, that, they, that he was innocent. And so, despite themselves, these enemies have to give this positive testimony, that he was without fault. How about us? What impression we give to those who surround us? Uh, I think of the Lord Jesus, what he said in John 8, that he was completely what he there was this transparency in him his actions and his behavior was one and they would not find anything against him we read then in verse 4 at the end inasmuch as he was faithful this is something the Lord would like to see in us according to the measure of light he has given us that we might be faithful Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4 that the characteristic of a steward is that he is faithful we have been placed here in this world as lights of the world, light shining in this world, Philippians 2, verse 15, and this function we have now, as Daniel in his days shone as a light, we may shine as heavenly lights in this dark world. We may show also this wisdom, as Daniel did, the wisdom from above may be seen in us. Let us be faithful in this 
way. Then in verse 4 at the end it says, Neither was there any error or fault found in him. I'm thinking of Joseph, the testimony the Holy Spirit gives of Joseph in the end of Genesis, and also of Job, Job who was perfect in his actions and behavior, even in his sufferings. In verse 5, these opponents, they come to the conclusion we cannot find anything in relation to the kingdom, so in relation to the rights of the king, or in his uh, job, in his work he does. By the way, we have spoken about our responsibility to be faithful, but how about our behavior to the authorities? How about Romans 13? Are we really respecting the authorities? Are we really faithful uh, with regard to the authorities? I think of tax we have to pay, and in other ways uh, we easily may fall into the same uh, routines and actions as people of this world uh, who do not respect the government and who are acting in uh, malpractice and trying to steal, as it were, from the government, avoiding tax, paying, and so on. Let us be like Daniel, in whom nothing could be found with respect to the kingdom, neither in respect to his daily work. But then they find, they try to find something against his God. They say, we shall not find any pretext against this Daniel unless we find it against him touching the law of his God. Now, this is a wonderful testimony again, despite themselves, that they knew, these opponents knew that Daniel would be faithful to his God. And so this will be one of the characteristics of the future remnant, his faithfulness towards God. But how about the Lord Jesus? How wonderful to see him also portrayed as for in Daniel, the one who was faithful unto his, to his God, the one who preferred to die to maintain God's rights. In Psalm 45, this wonderful expression, he loved righteousness. You know, he really maintained the law of his God. Matthew 5 to 7, we see how the Lord Jesus considered the law of his God and maintained his holy claims. But we as Christians, we would say we are not under the law. That's true. But we are under a moral law. Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, that he was free from the law, but nevertheless <coughs> subject, legally subject, in, uh, in the right sense of the word, not in a legalistic way, but legally, officially subject to Christ. And in Galatians 6 he speaks of the law of Christ. This is the law of the kingdom, as we see in James 2, the true law of liberty at the same time, but it is the law, the moral law, under which we are placed. And so, the question is, would we have the same testimony as Daniel with, regards, with regard to the rights of God? We have seen the rights of the king, but here it is also he was faithful towards God in connection with his rights. And then, these presidents and satraps find themselves together. Of course, they were people who would... Um, do anything to promote their own interest, but here they act together. And so we see also when the Lord Jesus, <coughs> when people wanted to get rid of the Lord Jesus, the fiercest enemies found themselves together in their approach to get rid of him. So here these people find themselves, they came in a body, they have unity, and so often we see this also in the history of the church, that the fiercest enemies uh, act one, in oneness, in unity, when it is against God and against the people of God. So it will be in the future, this unity against the remnant. And so there was the unity between Pilate and even Herod, his enemy, when it was against the Lord Jesus. This is, at the same time, a satanic plan. We see that it was not only jealousy, like in verse 4, we suggest that it was jealousy, which caused them to work, and jealousy is a form, of, is the root of many evils. But it was also in verse 13 we see this, because Daniel was of the children of the captivity of Judah. It was a racial hatred, as we see in the book of Esther also. Haman was his hatred against the Jews, and we may think of Genesis 3, where <coughs> the Lord had 
predicted already this enmity between uh, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, the, of Satan. And behind this hatred, of course, is Satan himself, as we see also clearly in the book of Esther. So these opponents were really moved by Satan himself. And so it will be in the future, the surrounding nations and those opposing the real remnant will be moved by satanic influence. So they come with their suggestion and notice the consequences of this suggestion in verse 7. They set God aside. We have seen how God had given the authority to the head of the nations. And now the head of the nations, in accepting this proposal, sets God himself aside. And he sets up himself in God's place. This is man declaring himself to be God. Again, Genesis 3 and 2 Thessalonians 2. There are evil motives at work. And thirdly, they would fool the king because they suggest this uh, proposal uh, and they play with his uh, sentiments, with the desire of the king, of course, to be honored. And they use flattery here. And in this sense, they fool him. And so many people will be fooled by the future Antichrist. And many people, alas, today are fooled by satanic and subtle means. You may think of the New Age movement. You may think of certain practices among Pentecostal circles. And so many, many other ways where we see how people are fooled. And here this king, he falls in the trap. We see how <coughs> it is because of his weakness. It is because of his desire to be number one and flattery is used and so the enemy will use different means to place man in the center and to set aside God. Different means as we have seen in chapter 3, 4 and 5 already. We may make another application also to our days uh, how people are fooled by writings, doctrines of evolutionism setting aside God's right as the creator and judge. Humanism, where man is placed in the center, the men help themselves. Uh, we see also how this works through in modern psychology and in other sciences, how man is set in the center and how God is set aside. And so ultimately, these philosophies have as a result that God is set aside. And this is apostasy, not giving God his right, his rightful place, and placing man in God's place. That is real apostasy. And that is the picture we have in chapter 6. So Darius is the victim of his own vanity, and although he is in himself amiable and attractive, he is here at the same time a picture, a picture of these future leaders who will act in apostasy and in hatred against God. This is often the case in the scriptures uh, that persons are seen on the one hand, I think of Ahasuerus in the book of Esther, he is not an amiable person, but at the same time he typifies God. And so we should recognize this in the, in the study of the types and the study also of the prophecies that uh, people may stand for certain principles despite of certain personal qualities. Now, then we come to verse 10. What is Daniel's reaction? Daniel's reaction is wonderful. I would suggest seven points in verse 10. Daniel knew that the writing was signed. So he heard about this. And then what does he do? Does he stop praying? No. Does he show more than before what he was doing? No. He just continues as he did four times. So the first point, he went into his house. Think of what the Lord said in relation to prayer in Matthew 6, that we should go into our inner room and close the door and be in God's presence in our own room. And this is what Daniel does. The first point, he realizes God's presence. God was set aside by the king, but Daniel realizes God's presence. Then there's a second point, his windows being open in his upper chamber toward Jerusalem. He did not open them now. They were always open. And notice it is in his upper chamber. The upper chamber would suggest 
a sphere where we are close to God. Although Daniel had these um, responsibilities in the kingdom, he was the prime minister, we would say, in modern day uh, setting. Nevertheless, he took time to be in the presence of the Lord and to pray, and not only that, he enjoyed this heavenly atmosphere. The upper chamber we find in Luke 22, the Lord had there a place with his disciples. In Acts 1 and 2, we find the disciples in the upper room, or at least in Acts 1. Later on, the upper room is used uh, in different chapters in the book of Acts. I think also of Eutychus, where Paul in Troas presented God thoughts. I think especially of John 13 to 17, where the Lord was in the upper room with the disciples. And so we may be in close fellowship with God despite the enmity around us. But what is the center of his interests? The center of his interest is Jerusalem. Jerusalem used to be God's dwelling place. But notice, we are here under the second empire. In the second empire, the first thing we read in the scripture, Cyrus did, was gave a decree that the Jews might go back to Jerusalem. And that's important. We do not read about this upper chamber toward Jerusalem, open window in this upper chamber toward Jerusalem in the other chapters. Of course, I think Daniel would uh, have prayed, but it's not mentioned. Here it is mentioned because Jerusalem had become the center of God's interest again. When we see the importance of Jerusalem in the scriptures, we would refer to Deuteronomy 12, although the name is not mentioned there, we see it. They're the divine center. When we think of Psalms like Psalm 132 and 138, Psalm 87, and you could find more Psalms where we find details about God's appointed center, where he would dwell with his people. And we may really have an impression of the importance of Jerusalem. You know, here, Daniel, he, re he realizes this, that God does not give up his center. Although the glory had departed from Jerusalem, God still maintains his soil. And that's a very practical thought for us in these days. In days of ruin, in days where Daniel lived, we may see this also in Daniel 9, where he confessed the sins of his people. He had a clear sense clear idea of God's center. And so we might apply this also in our days to the truth of the assembly. Um, although man has failed to maintain the unity of the body, to maintain God's thoughts in connection with the church, we see that God will never give up his thoughts. And Daniel was in line with God's thoughts. Daniel was in perfect uh, accord with God's thoughts in a practical way. And this is the challenge for you and me, reading this chapter, the challenge and the question also, am I in accord, practically, with God's center, with God's habitation? Uh, we see that uh, Solomon had foreseen the possibility that because of their unfaithfulness, the people would be outside the land, outside the country, and so far from this center of worship. And in his prayer, we can read it in 1 Kings 8 and 2 Chronicles 6, he has asked for a provision that God would even listen to those of his people who would be far away from this God-given center, and that God would listen to their supplication. And here we see how, because of this prayer, Daniel had his window open toward Jerusalem. The third point, he kneeled on his knees. Now, of course, we might say we cannot impose this, and it is not my intention to impose this, but it is a thought worthwhile to, to think about. The Lord, we find him kneeling in his prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane and in other, in other places. We find the Apostle Paul many times kneeling on his knees, and it speaks about dependence, it speaks about submission, and what a contrast with the rise. There is no self-exaltation uh, with Daniel. Instead of that, he kneels. Kneeling, we set aside our own greatness and we express our confidence in God 
looking away from our circumstances also, we look up to God. And he does this three times a day. He puts his trust in God, as we find also in the Psalms, where the psalmist does this three times a day. Such a remnant is there pictured in Daniel, in, excuse me, in David's attitude in Psalm 55, evening and morning, verse 17, and at noon will I pray and moan aloud, and he will hear my voice. So, of course, God heard Daniel's voice, and he prayed. That is the fifth point. As I said before, the expression of dependence, but prayer is more than that. Prayer is realizing God's presence, is communicating, is presenting our request. But it speaks of this intimate fellowship, intimate communion uh, with God. And it results then also in giving thanks. There are many passages which emphasize the importance of giving thanks, not only presenting our requests, but also with the supplications give thanks. And even in everything give thanks. That's what Daniel does. Some translations have he made confession. That's an important point, of course, as we hope to see in Daniel 9. But also this thought that he gave thanks. What a lesson for us. How often we forget this. And thankfulness is a real remedy for many problems. When we start to give thanks, instead of complaining, we will be greatly helped. And he does this in God's presence, before his God. And then this seventh point, of course, we could uh, divide the verse in another way that we have even more than seven points, as he did before time. You know, what a courage is this. He knew about this decree, but he did not uh, stop his habits because of this, because we've seen he realized the presence of his God. And I would also suggest that this speaks of his balanced personality. Daniel was a balanced person. And uh, we so easily fall into extremes. We are over-exaggerating sometimes, and then the next day we greatly fall short. Daniel is a real example of balance. Then we come to verse 11, the attitude of the enemies. They find out. And again, in a body, they are united against Daniel, and they see what he's doing, and then they go to the king to accuse Daniel, and we have seen in verse 13 already, one of their motives was that he was a Jew, this hatred against the Jews, that we see it even today, and also in the history of the church, this hatred of the Jews, uh, inspired by Satan, not willing to give to the Jews this place God had given them. God, from the foundation of the world, has a plan for them. And we should recognize them and honor them. But not only that, from the Jews was came forth the Savior. And in John 4 we see that salvation is from the Jews. So we should honor them instead of attacking them. Verse 14, <coughs> Then the king, when he heard these words, here we see how he has become the slave of his flatteries, of the flatteries of his subjects, how he is seen in his weakness. He cannot do anything to deliver Daniel. This is, by the way, a contrast with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, the absolute, the supreme ruler, he was not bound by any laws. And here we see how this authority deteriorated, this uh, quality of authority deteriorated. As we have seen in Daniel 2, the change from gold to silver. And we see also in verse 14 a parallel with Pilate. Uh, Pilate, the representative of the Fourth Empire, he became a slave of the Jews because he wanted to have the favor of the Jews. And also other leaders later on in the book of Acts, we see how constantly they wanted to win the favor of the Jews. And Pilate became really a slave of the Jews, of the uh, apostate Jews who wanted to uh, put aside the Lord Jesus. And here we see how Darius had become the slave of these evil men, these opponents of Daniel. Again here, a parallel then with uh, Daniel and the Lord Jesus. Like Pilate tried to save Daniel, uh, the Lord Jesus 
from the Jews. So here Darius wants to save Daniel from the efforts of his opponents, but with no result. And also we might apply this uh, to the future remnant who will be in distress and uh, despite efforts of people who are favorable to them, they will have to go through these sufferings. Then in verse 15 we see how they want to apply the law of the Medes and the Persians. Also in, the, in Esther, the book of Esther, we see how these decrees could not be reversed. And then Daniel is cast into the den of lions. Um, I would suggest here another principle also. We could say only God can reconcile the claims of righteousness with the sovereignty of grace. There are two thoughts here. We find united and only the death of the Lord gives the solution. And we have in Psalm 85, righteousness and peace have kissed uh, one another. Two different principles are united in the death of the Lord Jesus. As we see later on also the principle in, in, in Romans 3, for example, God's rights are satisfied and also God's grace, God's love is satisfied in the death of the Lord Jesus. Now here we see how the king says in verse 16, when he was cast into the lion's den. Later on we hope to meditate a little bit about the lion's den, the mouth of the lion. The stone we find also back in the story of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 27, 27 and 28, uh, where we see how the tomb was closed with a stone and even sealed with the signet. Of course, Pilate there, the representative of the Fourth Empire, seals it. And here the stone is sealed with the king's signet. We have several parallels here between Daniel and the Lord Jesus. As we have also in the story with David and Saul, David, a type of the future remnant, but also a type of the Lord Jesus, if you've seen, Spirit of Christ identifying himself with this future remnant. And therefore I would like to suggest Psalm 57, where we have David as type of the Lord Jesus and also a type of this future remnant in his conflict with Saul and Psalm 57 speaks about the cave the cave, a parallel here with this lion's den Psalm 57 he says be gracious unto me O God be gracious unto me for my soul takes refuge in thee yea in the shadow of thy wings do I take refuge and so he calls to God then in verse 4 my soul is in the midst of lions. Here, clear power is Daniel 6. I lie down among them that breathe out flames, the sons of men. Of course, the lions represent also these evil people surrounding Daniel. Verse 6, they have prepared a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They have digged a pit before me. They have fallen into the midst thereof. That's then the result of their own actions, as we hope to see at the end of Daniel 6, that they were cast themselves in this pit, into this pit. Then verse 8, verse 7, My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing, yea, I will sing songs. He realized God's presence. And then verse 8, Awake, my glory, awake, lute and harp, I will wake the dawn of deliverance. And also in Daniel 6 we see this new morning, the day of resurrection. And then verse 11, be exalted above the heavens, O God. That is the end of Daniel 6, the introduction of the millennium, where God will be honored. Now, there is also a clear power of this Psalm 22, where we see this new day, the dawn of resurrection. In Psalm 22, we see how the Lord cried to God and was answered. God answered him. And so, again, there is a clear power between Daniel and the Lord Jesus. So we see how the king went to, to bed, but could not sleep. Similar situation we find in Esther 6. And then, at break of day, in verse 19, I think during this night the king's heart was changed. He was humbled. There was a work of the Holy Spirit. And so, as I suggested at the beginning, there will be nations who will uh, repent. They will see God's work in connection with the remnant, and there will be a work of God in their own souls. They will repent. And you know, here it is linked with the day of resurrection. In a sense, this 
introduction of the future reign of the Lord Jesus will be as a resurrection day. In many passages in the Psalms and also in 2 Samuel 23 and other portions of the scriptures which suggest this new day as the day of the resurrection. And of course, uh, without the resurrection of the Lord, God's plans could not be fulfilled. Here in verse 19 we see this day of the resurrection. And what a change. First of all, uh, for Daniel, God's answer, God had answered him. And so the Lord Jesus, he was answered by God himself because God raised him from among the dead. That was God's answer, Psalm 22. And here, Daniel was answered by God. God protected him and delivered him from this lion's den. In the Gospels we may see in uh, each of the Gospels, the importance of the resurrection in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. And then later on in the book of Acts we see how the importance of the resurrection is stressed and then doctrinally in 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Timothy 1 and other passages we see how important the, Lord, the resurrection of the Lord is. It raises for everything. In verse 20 we see how the king asks, has thy God whom thou servest continually been able to save thee from the lions? Uh, by the way, we see here also a reference to Psalm 22 where we see the Lord's faithfulness and despite of his faithfulness he was uh, laid in to the dust of death. In verse 21 Daniel says, he respects the king, he honors the king, and then in verse 22 he explains what happened. My God has sent his angel. Now this is an expression we find back many times, think of Second Timothy 4, where the Apostle Paul realized God's presence in a special way when he was in the lion's den. And I would like to uh, refer now to these passages we have also in the Old Testament and in the New Testament about the lion's mouth. Passages which speak of the power of the enemy and of God's protection. In 1 Samuel 3, 17, we see how David, before Saul, spoke about the lion's mouth and how God had helped him to save the sheep from the lion's mouth. 1 Samuel 17, verse 34, And David said to Saul, Thy servant fed his father's sheep, and there came a lion and also a bear and took a lamb out of the flock and I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth and when he arose against me I seized him by his beard and smote him and slew him thy servant smote both the lion and the bear so here we see David's shepherd care to uh, deliver the sheep out of the lion's mouth this is one of the characteristics of our Lord Jesus who, how he would have this shepherd care and also we might apply this uh, in ourselves have we a similar attitude uh, love as a shepherd for uh, souls to deliver them from the mouth from the lion's mouth we notice in first peter 5 peter speaks about a roaring lion going around whom he might devour it's his fierce anger against the people of God. The devil is portrayed in many different ways, sometimes very subtle as a serpent, sometimes as a dragon to devour, he is Satan and the devil, many different aspects. But here we see him also as a lion. The beer, by the way, just a little parenthesis, would more speak about his subtlety. Now in these uh, countries where we live, he reveals himself in a very subtle way, like a deer would approach his prey. But uh, the lion, the roaring lion, is in connection with persecuting, persecution, like we have here in Daniel 6, and like the future remnant will experience, and like many Christians today experience. The shepherd care we see also in Amos 3. It's remarkable that these passages in connection with the lion's mouth we find back in different dispensations, different periods, and in Amos 3, we see how this future remnant itself will be saved uh, from the lion, and only a few will be saved. In Amos 3, verse 4, 
we have first a reference to the lion. Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a, li- a young lion cry out of his den if he has taken nothing? Here we see the lion roaring. But then in verse 12, and so it will be in the future, this roaring lion. So it was also in relation to the Lord, the roaring lion uh, against the Lord Jesus. But here especially in connection with the future remnant, in 3 verse 12, Thus saith Jehovah, like as the shepherd rescues out of the jaw of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be rescued that sit in Samaria. Of course, here it refers to the ten tribes, but we may apply it to the future remnant uh, also of the Jews, how they will be rescued by the Lord out of the jaw of the lion. Two legs, they will be able to walk. We see in Revelation 14 how there is this remnant following the lamb wherever it goes. The piece of an ear, they will have a real ear to listen to God's voice. But this is characteristic of Daniel. He was serving God. He had a good walk and a good ear, and so he was rescued, rescued by the Lord himself. So it will be with the future remnant. And there is another uh, reference to the lion's mouth, Psalm 22 now, in connection with the Lord himself, how he was answered by God himself from the mouth of the lion. He cries to God, all my strength, hasty to help me, in verse 19, deliver my soul from the sword. Save me from the lion's mouth, verse 21. And then thou hast answered me. God's answer came in raising him from among the dead. This was the Lord himself. So here we see very clear, a very clear parallel between Daniel in the lion's den and the Lord Jesus uh, in the lion's mouth. Imagine in the lion's mouth and even preserved there. So the future remnant will be preserved uh, think of Revelation 12, how they will be preserved in the lion's mouth, as it were. But not only to the Lord Jesus, there is a clear reference also now to us in Hebrews 11, verse 33, where we have this remarkable verse. Hebrews 11, verse 30, excuse me, Hebrews 11, verse 33. Who by faith overcame kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped lion mouth, quenched the power of fire. And then there's three. But stopped lion's mouth. And there's six. We may say God uh, stopped the lion's mouth. And that's true. Uh, like Daniel says, My God has sent his angel. That is God's representative. But uh, as we find many times in the scriptures, it stands for God himself. God being with his people, like in Daniel 3, the Lord himself was with his people. We have seen that in Isaiah 63 also, this wonderful verse, how God was with them in all their distress. And here God himself, as it were, is through his angel, is present with Daniel, and saves him from the lion's mouth. But Hebrews 11 puts the emphasis on Daniel's faith, not on what God did, although that is perfectly true but on Daniel's faith. It was his faith which stopped the lion's mouth. And here's a challenge for you and me, that our faith might be so great, so magnificent, so powerful, as even to stop the lion's mouth. And this, again, you see, of course, in the perfect way of the Lord Jesus, and we will see it in the future then. But the challenge of this chapter is that we might realize it, as we have in the example of the Apostle Paul. You see, the Apostle Paul is a real example for the believers. And he says in Second Timothy 4, verse 17, But the Lord stood with me and gave me power that through me the proclamation might be fully made and all those of the nation should hear. And I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. Here he experiences this. Now he was delivered by God's intervention, the intervention of the Lord, to deliver him from the lion's mouth. He was referring, to, without doubt, to Nero, the Roman emperor. And so Paul says, The Lord shall deliver me from every wicked work and shall preserve me for his heavenly kingdom, to him to whom be glory for the ages of ages. 
wonderful passages referring to the lion's mouth and God's intervention, but also, as we have seen in David and in Paul and in Daniel, their own personal faith. And then he says in verse 22, inasmuch, for as much as before him, again, he realizes God's presence, innocence was found in me. So it was with the Lord Jesus, perfectly innocent. And so it will be with the future remnant, Revelation 14, these characteristics, wonderful characteristics, which speak of their innocence, their purity. So it is also in Daniel 9, and later on we see how Daniel had wonderful qualities, acceptable and precious to God. In verse 23, thereupon was the king exceeding glad, and, the, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. Uh, I forgot to mention another reference where we see how the Lord was answered, how his prayers were answered, and he was delivered. In Hebrews 5, verses 7 and 8, we see how the Lord suffered, how he prayed and was answered by God himself because of his piety. So Daniel could be taken away out of the lion's den because the law had been uh, fulfilled. The law was executed, and so it was with the Lord Jesus. Uh, in his death, the law was executed, and so... Here we see that something new comes in, resurrection. And uh, you find it back not only in Psalm 22, but also in Psalm 40, Psalm 69, uh, Psalm 16. In uh, Acts 2 we see how important it is God's intervention in the resurrection. How God allowed the enemy to kill the Lord Jesus, although it was because the wickedness of man. It was also uh, God's determined counsel. But then, in the resurrection, he honors uh, the Lord Jesus, and identif God identifies himself with his man. And so here, Daniel, God identifies himself with his man in preserving him and raising him, as it were, out of the tomb. And so God will identify himself in a public way with this future remnant. And may God identify himself with us, and we are faithful as Daniel was. Because it says in verse 23, because he believed in his God. This is what we found in Psalm 22, the trust the Lord Jesus has in his God, and in Hebrews 11, Daniel's faith. Then what happened to the enemies? The king commanded, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and cast them into the den of lions. We've seen this in Psalm 57. We may refer also to number 16, where we have the case of uh, Korah and his sons, or his family. And this, by the way, gives also an important lesson. Some would say, but this was unrighteous that these wives and children would be killed. Let us say two things about this. The wives, of course, would uh, be identified with the actions of their husbands. And secondly, the children, when these would have been young children, it is a proof of God's mercy to them. Because what would these children do be without their parents? But when these children have been older, it is because of their own sin, because they identify themselves with their parents. And the contrast we see with the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah stood away from the iniquity of Korah and the others. And so when these children would thrown, be thrown into the den of life, when they were young children, it would be for their own benefit, because we know that the Lord would have pity on these little children you know that because the Lord's work that God would accept all these little children who would not have uh, fallen into sin and in rebellion against God and this is, this is a real uh, comfort to know also for parents who have lost young children but on the other hand when these children were older they were responsible for their own actions and then of course as such they would be thrown with their parents into the lion's den and so as he said in the beginning, this would speak also about God's judgment upon the nations who have shown hatred towards the people of Israel. And it is also God's retribution, as we have in Psalm 69, because of their actions against the Lord Jesus. God's retribution will come upon the enemies of the Lord Jesus, as we have here in verse 24. Now, we come to verse 25, and... Uh, as I said in the beginning, I'd like to link this with the introduction of the future millennium, where peace will be. 
in verse 25, Daniel, uh, Darius wrote, and to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Because you have also in the New Testament the thought of the inhabited earth is there where the Roman Empire had authority, but of course this empire would stand also as a type of the future reign under the Lord Jesus where all nations and all peoples and all languages will be included in this reign. And then peace will be multiplied. Peace will be multiplied in this reign of peace. Now, he says in verse 26, I made a decree. The first decree was broken, or let's say it in another way, the first decree was broken by Daniel because of Daniel's faithfulness, but the second decree <coughs> was broken, of course, because man uh, in this world will never be able to honor such a decree. It really would speak about the situation in the millennium. Only then such a decree will be carried out, that every dominion of my kingdom will tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. Notice the power of God, the living God in resurrection, the power of resurrection, and in the power of preserving this remnant. This is a, tr a true characteristic of the living God, that he is the power of resurrection and steadfast forever. Stability and the stability of his principles and his kingdom, which shall not be destroyed. Of course, he does not speak here about God's eternal kingdom of, God, of God's providence, but it would speak also about his kingdom in this play, as will be in the millennium. Daniel 2, we have seen this, and we hope to see this also in Daniel 7, that his dominion will be set up under the Son of Man. His dominion shall be even unto the end. Compare this also with First Corinthians. 15, and of course the reign as we see in Revelation 20. So God uh, receives glory now as a result of uh, where Daniel had come through. Also God received the glory as a result of Darius repentance. And so God will receive the glory from the nations in the millennium. And also in this sense, uh, this chapter is a climax when you compare the doxologies in these different chapters of the Confessions by Nebuchadnezzar and now this uh, doxology of the Rias, uh, there is real progress we come in this sense in chapter 6 also to a climax in closing I'd like to say something about Cyrus we have seen in Daniel a type of the Lord Jesus in his humiliation in his per how he was attacked by man, persecuted, and we have seen how Daniel also is a type of the future remnant. We see the same in Jonah, type of the Lord Jesus, in his death, burial, and resurrection. But at the end of chapter 6, there is also a type of the Lord Jesus in his exaltation, in his glory. And this is wonderful, because both aspects belong together, as you see very clearly in Philippians 2, how the Lord's humiliation uh, goes together with his exaltation. Again, in the book of Esther, we see something similar in Mordecai, in his sufferings, and then later on in his uh, glory, and in his exaltation, in Esther 10, in the future reign, future millen in the millennium. And so we have, at the end of Daniel 6, also a type of the Lord Jesus in his uh, exaltation. And this type is Cyrus, the Persian, the only Semite in uh, this uh, head, head of the nations. And Nebuchadnezzar was a Semite. The other leaders were Jephthites, but Cyrus was a Semite. But not only that, Cyrus was introduced by Isaiah, or let's say it in a different way. In Isaiah we see how God predicts that this leader will come, this Cyrus. And uh, there are some very remarkable expressions God uses. There are seven references in Isaiah to this King Cyrus. And uh, I would read just a few passages and uh, bring out a few points. In Isaiah 44, verse 28, we see that God says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd. And so here he is a picture of the Lord Jesus. He was the true shepherd because he 
gave this decree that the, the Jews could go back from the captivity to Jerusalem. So he was a shepherd in relation to the Jews. And then he shall perform all my pleasure. That's the second uh, aspect. Uh, who really uh, performs all God's pleasure is the Lord Jesus. God's pleasure in his humiliation, indeed in De David also, God had found a man after his own heart. And in Acts 13 we see how he would do all God's will. Uh, he came to perform all God's pleasure. So God found his pleasure in him. Uh, not only in his humiliation, but also in the way he acted and also in the way he will uh, execute God's judgment. Everything will be according to God's pleasure, according to God's delight. And so Cyrus typifies here the Lord Jesus who would perform everything according to God's pleasure. And it's explained here in Isaiah 44 verse 28, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. That was for God's interest. We are not speaking about Cyrus himself here. As we said before, Darius also, uh, he is a type in Daniel 6 of the Antichrist and the leader of the Roman Empire and also the nations in general, the apostasy against God. And so here Cyrus is not necessarily born again. We have even other proofs here in Isaiah. God says, although he does not know me, but in the types of the scriptures he is a clear type of the Lord Jesus. Also in chapter 45 verse 1 where this passage continues simply, the third point to mention thus says Jehovah to his anointed, to Cyrus. So his anointed anointed uh, when we read anointed we immediately think of the Messiah in the Old Testament the priest was anointed the king was anointed and also the prophet. The Lord Jesus is the true anointed one. We find it in the book of Acts very clearly how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. So he is the true anointed one. And so his anointed Cyrus is a clear type of the Lord Jesus. And then the next passage in chapter 48 verse 14. All ye gather yourselves together and hear which among them has declared these things. He whom Jehovah has loved shall execute his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be on the Chaldeans. We will see how the Medes, as we have in other passages, and Persians together would execute God's judgment upon Babylon, upon the Chaldeans. But notice this expression here. He whom Jehovah has loved. Here we see the true David. David, the beloved one, Jehovah has loved him. And we see in the New Testament in a special way how God has expressed his delight in the Lord Jesus. And also in John's Gospel, we find seven times God's love for the Lord Jesus. He whom Jehovah has loved. A wonderful expression here. And this helps us to understand that Cyrus, indeed, is a type of the Lord Jesus, but then, of course, in his exaltation. At the end of Daniel 6, we see uh, thus a clear picture of the future reign, the future uh, millennium and dominion of the Son of Man, where God will be honored, will be uh, respected and known as the living God, and where uh, he will be seen, although through the judgment, but then will be seen and honored as the true God, and where we see the Lord Jesus exalted and honored. A wonderful picture of what will happen in the future. And we know him already as crowned with honor and glory. For us, through faith, it's already a reality. But then it will be displayed uh, in a public way, and the Lord Jesus will be the true Cyrus, the true head of the nations, and every knee will bow down before him and thus before God, the living God.